Lecture 5, Basic Descriptive Statistics, Measures of Dispersion. So just as a quick recap from the previous lectures, when we are using descriptive statistics, we are usually looking at conducting what we call univariate analysis. That is analysis of one variable at a time, so describing the characteristics of each variable. In the last lecture, we had a look at measures of central tendency. And in this series of slides, we're going to have a look at the third common approach to univariate analysis, and that is looking at measures of dispersion. So what do we mean by measures of dispersion? When we think about it, it's really about a, a statistical way of measuring the amount of spread or variation in a distribution of values. So it's having a look statistically at how values are spread within a particular distribution of values in a variable. Now, as we had, um, as discussed in lectures two and four, it's only really interval and ratio variables that generate data that can actually be ranked and where the distance between each value can be measured. So it's the only real variable type um, in comparison to nominal and ordinal that can provide a single mathematical value for each observation that we can use in calculating true measures of dispersion. Now, when we think about different measures of dispersion, how we go about measuring it, we think of three different things. We think of calculating the range, the standard deviation, and the variance. We're going to discuss each one of these in turn through this, through this particular lecture. But it's worth actually noting at this point that whilst we say that these particular measures, so range, standard deviation, and variance, as being measures of, disper of dispersion are only applicable to interval or ratio data, we can also use ordinal data to look at the range as well. So if you think about an ordinal variable, um, and if you think about, say, one that has a look at somebody's level of agreement with a particular statement, so moving from, say, strongly agree to strongly disagree, that in effect uh, will give you a range of answers from strongly agree to strongly disagree and they can be ranked so we can have a look that, at them in some form of hierarchy but what we can't do is calculate any form of range in a numeric format we can only look at the range in probably what is easier to describe as a qualitative format Okay, so we can't actually look at it in numeric format. So yes, you do sometimes hear of ordinal variables using the range as a measure of dispersion, but in this case we're looking at quantitative methods and we're looking at how we quantitatively calculate the range, standard deviation and variance, and for that we need data that actually has numbers. So this slide here gives us a quick sort of brief description of what each of the measures of dispersion are. So if we start with the range, the range is basically the difference between our highest or our maximum value and the lowest or our minimum value in our particular distribution. So if we had um, people's, age, people's age ranges within a survey data set and they would range say from the lowest um, aged person of being 16 up to the highest aged person of being 85 and our range would be between 16 and 85. The variance is simply a measure of spread and we're going to explain a little bit more about the variance uh, shortly. The standard deviation shows the relation that that particular set of data has to the mean of the sample data and we're going to describe that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So describing the range, the range is really very simply the difference between your highest and your lowest value in a particular distribution. So if we take the example that we have here of the weekly income of 10 different people, if we place those in order we can see that we start from our minimum value of £180 and work our way all the way up to a maximum value of £350. So to calculate the range we take the maximum income minus the minimum income which is 350 minus 180 and that gives us 170. Now as we talked about earlier the range can really only apply to data that has some form of order that is either ordinal or scale data, so that's interval or ratio. 
Nominal data, don't forget, does not have an order. They're independent variables. So if you imagine um, gender, if you gave two options, two different categories for gender, so say male and female, you can't order them and you can't measure any difference between those particular answers. They just simply are what they are. So nominal data then represents categories that can't be placed in any form of order. Therefore, it's really rather illogical to try and calculate a range which requires order. Ordinal data um, already shows the range. Okay, so i.e. if we think about um, from agree to disagree, if we had that as a particular variable open to people answering. So all the range does in this case with ordinal data is just describe the data rather than actually look at how values are distributed within the range. So therefore, yes, ordinal data can use a range, but it doesn't actually say anything about how the values are distributed within the range. This is why we need numeric or numbers to actually be able to do that. So in this next slide we can see here the range using ordinal data. So if we use this as an example, so a survey question is how useful did you find the book? Okay, you can see a number of different ways of looking at that. Okay, so you can see that people have answered it a number of different ways from first person said very useful, the second person said very unuseful, the third person has said very useful, and so on and so forth. So having a look at those, we can say that the range is from very useful to very unuseful. So ordinal data in this case already shows our range, but it describes our data rather than looking at how values are actually distributed within the range. The interquartile range can tell us a little bit more about how values are distributed. So with the interquartile range, it's a, another measure okay, within, within looking at the range of your, of your values, but this time it actually looks at the data in terms of quartiles or percentiles. So our range is divided into four equal percentiles. So if we have a look at, say for example, our previous one of people's um, average weekly income, we'd start with our minimum value and work upwards to our maximum value. So our minimum value was uh, 180 and our maximum value was 350. From that, we could then calculate what, what the range was by dividing it into four different equal percentiles or quarters. So what our first quarter was, what our median percentile was, and what our third quarter was. And that would give us our range. Now the interquartile range is the distance between our 25th and our 75th percentile, or our first and our third quarter. So given that our interquartile range is the value that's between our, our second and our third quartile, it really is a measure of the middle 50% of the data. And because it is the measure of the middle 50% of the data, it's not affected by outliers or extreme values. So the interquartile range, we don't actually have a look at the values at the very bottom of the data and the values at the very top. What do we mean by outliers? Now, outliers are variables that are very extreme. So they lie at the very extreme ends, either at the very, very bottom or the very, very top. They are what we call a typical or infrequent observation. So they're things that we don't see that much of. Now the presence of outliers, so those atypical values at the very bottom and the atypical values at the very top, they will end up influencing our mean. Why is that the case? If you imagine um, 10 people and they record their height, so from 160 centimetres right up to 200 centimetres tall, if we calculate the mean based on all of those different 10 values, our mean comes out at 171 centimetres. Now looking at that data, you can see that in general people are ranging within the 160s to 170s value. That person who's 200 centimetres tall is extremely tall in comparison to the rest of the group. Therefore, we would consider that person to be atypical or infrequent, and we would consider them, therefore, to be an outlier. If we took that, that value out, 
of our sample it would actually bring our mean down to 168, which in fairness is more representative of the majority of people within that sample. So you can see that it's important to understand how our data is actually distributed so that we can see whether we have any extreme values that are likely to affect the way in which we measure our data. So the variance is our second measure of dispersion. Our variance essentially measures the spread of our distribution. So where we take the mean as being the measure of the center, of, so of where the center point is on our data, our variance measures how, how, how varied or how spread the data is from the mean. So it measures the distance between each of the values and the mean, so how far away from the average do each of those values lie. To calculate the variance we start off first by calculating our mean. So we calculate our mean or our average of all of our values. So we take all of our values and add them up and divide them by the number of values present. So all of the people's age ranges divided by the number of people that reported their age. The second step in doing that is that for each value within the distribution, we subtract the mean and then square the result. This gives us what we call the squared difference. Now, squaring the result, why do we do this? Well, if you think about it, if you just subtract the mean from each value within the distribution, so if you had 10 people's ages and you said, well, this person's age 19 and then you just subtract the mean from it, you would end up with positive numbers for all of those values that are above the mean and negative numbers for all of those that are below the mean. So if you imagine the average being in the middle, anyone who is above that average, if you take their mean away from them, they're obviously they're going to be a positive number. For anyone who is aged below the mean, so if the mean is 20 and somebody's age is 19, if you take the mean away, you're going to end up with a negative number because 19 minus 20 gives you minus 1. By doing this, if you then add all of those results together, so the value of the distribution subs, um, subtracted and subtracting the mean, if you add all of those values that you've generated for each person within that distribution and add the results together, they just end up cancelling each other out because all your negative numbers end up cancelling out all your positive numbers and therefore you'd end up with a variance of zero. If you imagine multiplying two negative numbers this gives a positive um, and we square each result. So multiply them together it gives us a positive and we then square the result. By squaring these results we make all the deviations positive so we can add them up. So we essentially make all of our negative numbers positive so that when we add them all together, we can add them up. In addition, by squaring our numbers, it gives much larger weight to larger numbers, whether those are positive or negative, than it does to the numbers that are much more closer to zero. So if you imagine a number of uh, 50, if you square 50, you get 2,500. And that is much bigger than a value of 25, where if you square that, then you get a value of 625. So that is why we actually end up squaring our results to give us the squared difference. And then we just go about calculating the average of those squared differences. So we can see what we mean. We can see the variance actually summarized in the form of an equation. And what that equation basically means is the variance, or S squared, is the sum of the observed value minus our mean score squared divided by the total number of scores minus 1. So that's exactly what we described on the last slide. The larger the variance value, it means the further the observed values of the data set are dispersed from the mean. So if we have a very, very large variance value, it means that our observed values in our data set are, are generally well dispersed away from the mean.
a variance value of 0 means that all of our observed values are the same as the mean. So it shows you the closer your, your S squared or your variance value is to 0, the more closely aligned they are to the mean. The bigger your value of F squared, of F squared the more dispersed your values are away from the mean. Our third measure of dispersion is what we call standard deviation. Now, we use standard deviation far more widely than we use variance. Um, now, standard deviation is basically how far on average each value is from the mean. The reason why we use standard deviation over variance is because what we have gone through in the process of calculating the variance, i.e. squaring our differences, it means that firstly our units of variance, they're not the same as the units that the data represents. And this can make interpretation of the results incredibly problematic. So if the variance is square rooted, then the unit of variance then corresponds to the data set. Square rooting our variance is reported as our standard deviation. So if you imagine if we start squaring data, it doesn't actually represent the data that we're observing because we have actually squared the differences. We actually need to square root those, so almost return them back to normal to return the same unit of measurement as we're looking at in our data. And this is why generally we calculate standard deviation instead. Standard deviation is far more representative of the data set that we're looking at. And also as a value, it's by far easier to deal with. In most disciplines, we use standard deviation far more frequently than we use variance. Standard deviation scores are also um, important because they enable us to generate standardized or Z scores as well. Now standard deviation as an equation you can see here is given on this particular slide and you can see that we have exactly the same equation as the variance but this time we have a great big square root around it. Okay so as it's square rooted, the results start corresponding to the original data units. And let's think of an example of this. So if the variable is our height, and we call it in centimetres, then the standard deviation can be interpreted in centimetres. If we had in variance, if we were looking at the variance of that instead, so our S squared value, we're not really looking at data that is recorded in centimetres because we have squared all our differences. Okay, so we can't actually interpret our variance in the same unit that we've recorded it in. So we've recorded our height in centimetres by squaring everything. We're not actually looking at centimetres anymore. So that's why standard deviation is by far more useful to us. But it's important to understand variance so we understand how we calculate standard deviation and why it looks like the way it does. Now, as with everything, that we are coming to find in this lecture series, it is everything comes down to being able to understand what level of measurement your variable can be ascribed to, so i.e. whether it is nominal, ordinal or interval in ratio. This means that by knowing these things it helps us to be able to choose the right method for understanding how we calculate our uh, measures of distribution, how we have a look at our measures of central tendency and it certainly helps us with how we go about looking at our measures of dispersion. So in this summary slide this shows us if we have a look at all of the different descriptive statistics that we've covered so, um, so distribution, dispersion and central tendency it can tell us a little bit about what each type of level of measurement, what we can use. So if we start off with our nominal variables, nominal variables or categorical data, okay, is data that comprises of categories that cannot be ranked in order. Each category is just different. Therefore, you can't measure the distance between values. So you can't measure the distance between, say, male or female. So they have absolutely no mathematical qualities. Therefore, the only things that we can do with them is 
have a look at how many people fall into each category using a frequency table. So this will tell us about our distribution. So it'll tell us how many males and how many females we have within um, a particular data set. We can count them or we can use a percentage. In terms of measures of central tendency, again, we can't use a measure of central tendency that requires any mathematical operations, and the only one that is that is mode. And mode is very similar to uh, to counting or percentaging um, in a frequency table. So mode counts the most popular response. For measures of dispersion, we can't use any measures of dispersion with the nominal data, and that is because there is no there's no mathematical quality to nominal data. For ordinal data, we can use all the things that we use with nominal data. Okay, so ordinal data, ordinal variables are the next hierarchical level up from nominal data. And like nominal data, the data is based on categories. But the difference with ordinal over nominal is that here the values can be ranked in some form of order, i.e. from good to bad or from agree to disagree. Therefore, we can use all of the same things that we could use with nominal data, but we can add a few more on. So in this case, we can add on median as a measure of central tendency because we can find the middle value. Okay, so we can put all of our data from uh, good to bad or agree to disagree, we can put that in some form of rank order and we can find what the middle value is. With, me with measures of dispersion, we can't really mathematically calculate any measure of dispersion. We talked about the range in ordinal, um, in ordinal values earlier, but in this case we're talking about quantitatively measuring dispersion. Up from ordinal data in the hierarchy is our scale data, which is either interval or ratio data. So in addition to the ability to be ranked, as we have with ordinal data, the distance between each value um, with interval and ratio data can actually be measured. Therefore, it's the only variable type that can provide a single mathematical value for each observation. Therefore, everything um, can be used. So in this case we build on what we can use with ordinal data and we add on in our measures of central tendency we add on our mean because we can actually mathematically find our average. With our measures of dispersion we can add all the measures of dispersion in so range, variance and standard deviation.